Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek and Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Holacek. Glad to be here. I'm happy to have you, and I'm very excited to talk about this letter. Um, this is our, uh, gosh, I've lost track of how many episodes we've done. Um, Dr. Holacek is a PhD retired professor of philosophy and history who taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University. Um, he's also the editor of the Journal of Thomas Jefferson and His Time, and he's the author and editor of numerous published books and close to 150 essays on Thomas Jefferson. His li list of books and locations of his published essays will be in the video description. Uh, with our show, One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson's. And today we have, um, we started to tell everyone last week, um, that you'd like to discuss the letter from Thomas Jefferson to Dr. Vine Utley. Unlike other writings chosen, this one is relatively short, yet it seems to give us much about the daily physical habits of Thomas Jefferson. And so today we discuss Thomas Jefferson's 1819 letter to Dr. Vine Utley. I am Donna Vitek, and this is One Work, Five Questions. Are you ready, Dr. Holacek? I, I am ready, let's do it. Let's okay, go. question number one. Who was Vine Utley, and why does Jefferson write him such a letter? Uh, Utley was a physician from Connecticut, and uh, he had corresponded with Benjamin Rush. We did Benjamin Rush before, okay. uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush, and uh, Utley was interested in aging and regimen. Okay. Daily habits, physical health, and uh, he would write a pamphlet called Observations on Old People 80 Years of Age. And strangely enough, Utley never made it to 80, never made it even to 70. I think he died when he was, what, he was 1768 to 1836. So he was 68 when he passed. Um, but he was, you know, very, very interested in physical habits and, and physical health, noting a correlation. So he uh, corresponded with, with Benjamin Rush and asked Rush for his, his regimen, what he did to, for health. And Russell Rush responds with a, a letter, a sort of template for, when I say template, I mean a sort of template for the sort of letter that, that Utley's gonna write to Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson will include, I mean, Utley will include the letter that Rush wrote just to give Jefferson uh, some sort of idea of what he should be saying. And Jefferson says that at the letter, he'd be all confused if there weren't an, an, an enclosure. So um, Utley wants advice from Jefferson on, I quote, uh, following the old Latin saw, being old when young so that I might be young when old. In other words, I'm living in a temperate manner. So, uh, so he sends, questions, similar questions to Jefferson that he sent to Rush and he sends Rush, Rush's letter in reply that, like I said, is a template for an answer. <laughs> I said, what a HIPAA violation that was. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Um, num question number two. Thomas Jefferson begins by stating that he lives so much like other people that I might refer to ordinary life as the history of my own. What exactly does he mean? And is he just being modest? Yeah, I guess so. You know, it's typical Jefferson. It's, you know, he's just like, um, at the end of the letter, he says, uh, my life has been so much like that of other people. I might say with Horace to everyone, Nomine mutato narrator fabula de te, which means something like um, I changed the name and the the fable, the story that is narrated is yours. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, you I'll give you in other words, I'll give you my story, but it's the story of every man USA, you yeah. know, any person, any average person, and. When we get into the to the nuts and bolts of what Jefferson has to say, we're going to say he wasn't, you know, even in his daily physical habits, he wasn't like 
ordinary people. And ordinary people did not practice the sort of self-control that Jefferson practiced. So he was certainly anything. He was super ordinary, not ordinary. It's just sort of, yeah, he was being modest, if that's what you want to call it. So it's kind of weird. Yeah. Oh, I like, I actually, I, that's one of his appealing qualities to me. <laughs> um, qu yeah. Question number three, tell us about Jefferson's habits. Does anything stick out as unusual? Yeah, in, in the letter, he very seldom ate meat. He said he, so he, he loved garden peas. I mean, he grew so many different types of peas. And if you go into his garden, you you know, I visited Monticello on several occasions. You stay away from the tour guides who tell you the, the stupid stuff that never happened. <laughs> and you just, I were walking around the gardens, just looking at the sort of things that he grew. And he had so many different vegetables and he loved his vegetables. So, I mean, he ate meat just as sort of an aside, if I can say, call it that, just something to complement the vegetables. You know, I guess today we would think, most people think, okay, well, you know, the guys, at least I want my big steak. And then, well, I don't know, I'll figure out what to put, maybe some a baked potato and some green beans. I don't, but it's just the, the, the meal consists of the steak and then other stuff. Whereas for Jefferson, it was, no, it's my vegetables. And yeah, maybe I'll have a little piece of meat on the side or something like that. So... It was, he called it a condiment for the vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> condiment, most the choice of words. What is a condiment? Something like ketchup you'd put on your baked potato. Yeah. So he drank, he, he confessed that he drank double the amount, sometimes treble the amount of rush in wine, which would be rush at a, a glass and a half a day. So Jefferson said, I drink three glasses a day, sometimes four and a half if I have pleasant company. But he doesn't drink strong wines. Uh, he drinks weak wines. He, he drinks no ardent spirits. He drinks malt liquor and cider during the day, tea and coffee at breakfast. He says he has no borborygmus, the gurgling of the stomach, uh, because his digestion is so good. He fails to mention that he suffered throughout his life from explosive diarrhea. He always had a problem with diarrhea. Uh -huh. uh, and Maybe he was getting too much fiber from the vegetables. <laughs> it could very well be, but you know, you imagine that today. It's a very serious problem for someone who, you know, and we have cars today and, and indoor plumbing and toilets, but imagine being on your horse and you're 20 miles from home and you have diarrhea, you're in yeah. serious trouble. You have to sort of turn around and get cleaned up, I guess. Um, Concerning other habits, uh, those were his elementary habits. Concerning other habits, he mentions five to eight hours sleep. Uh, I have to have eight to nine, I'm sorry to say. Uh, he didn't. He says, depending upon my book or the company I keep. So if he has pleasant company or really good book, he doesn't have a problem staying up late to finish the passage of book. And he says, I rise with the sun. I use uh, glasses only at night or if the print is very, very tiny. Um, he has no catars, no phlegm buildup from the chest and stuff. And he says, well, that's because I've been for 60 years, I've been bathing my feet in cold water. Huh. I have no clue what the correlation is between bathing your feet in cold, cold water and not having, you know, congestion, but he claims that, you know, uh, I suspect highly that there's no causal link at all there, huh. but he thinks that there is. He also says that he had a fevers. He, uh, he's never had a fever of over 24 hours, more than two or three times in his life, which I find right. sort of astonishing. Um, he does mention his periodic migraines because he suffered from migraines at times of high stress after his death of his mother, when he was engaged with Hamilton as secretary of state and any times of high stress. He had uh, frequent, you know, I, I mean, I have it in one of my books, how many migraines he had and it's cataloged at Monticello's webpage. So um, how many, when he had his migraines from looking at his memoirs. But uh, so he does mention that, but he says, I haven't uh, had them. And he is at the time, what, uh, 1819. So he's an old man at the time in his uh, 70s. And um, he mentions that he still rides six to eight miles a day on his on horseback. He can't walk very well. And he does 30 to 40 miles on good days. So that's pretty, pretty physically robust person for the time. Yeah. Wow.
He was a big fan of walking, though, in his early days. He said the Native Americans walk all the time and they can do it all day without getting tired. We should be able to do it too. <laughs> That's interesting. Hmm. Well, that, that uh, you've just mentioned two possible uh, potential good topics um, for future discussions. Um, Thomas Jefferson's relationship with the Native Americans and Thomas Jefferson's relationship with um, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> The, the last is a very complex issue. Um, yeah, I think yeah, you know we could cover that. And his ish, the, the, his relationship with Native Americans is very intriguing as well because it was ambiguous. It was he loved and hated at the same time, and you can only hate when you love. He very deeply loved Native Americans, and yet some letters express great hostility. And the great hostility clearly is evidence of great love that he felt at cases was unrequited. But I divagate. Yes. Back to Vine Utley. <laughs> Question number four. Um, Thomas Jefferson talks about being a hard student until I entered on the business of life. What does he mean by that? Well, that's easily answered. He says, I was a hard student until I entered on the business of life, the duties of which leave me no idle time to those disposed uh, to fulfill them. And now retired at the age of 76, he's 76. I'm again a hard student. He says, indeed, my fondness for reading and study revolts me from the drudgery of letter writing. I think it's um, being a hard student for Jefferson just means someone who is engaged in study, who's a natural scientist, who's a, a philosopher, who's studying uh, the cosmos and how it works and studying nature and studying farming. You know, he's, even though he professes always to have uh, interest in practicality and he is, he's very much a theoretician when it comes to things. He's got to work things out on paper and then even when he's related to farming, he draws everything up on paper, his thoughts on paper regarding anything. And then, he, you know, before he puts it into practice, which is a very good thing to do. Right. But oftentimes he thinks that because something can work on paper, it has to work in practice. And uh, he gets frustrated with it not working in like farming. You know, if I plan my fields out like this, if it doesn't work, well, it's because the rain wasn't or it was mismanaged or something. He doesn't want to blame his thinking, his, but, but that's that. So he was a um, hard student, just means someone intimately involved in, in study, studying nature and studying things, the way the world works. I, I was surprised, I have to say, that he um, used drudgery of letter writing. How many letters? I mean, he's, he, he's written the most letters to, uh, of all the founding fathers, right? Or, I couldn't tell you. I don't know if Washington wrote more. Um, he wrote some 19,000, but he always had his uh, polygraph. Polygraph, you know, for us means something different, but it meant for him. Pol uh, polis in Latin is many, and, you know, the graph is writing. Many, you know, it's many writing, something like that. So, I mean, he'd have this machine set up so that when he's writing his letter, there would be a corresponding pen on another sheet of paper making a, an identical copy or close to identical copy of it. So there were some 19,000 letters and wow. it was drudgery for a couple of reasons. We, that's another topic to get into his the oh. letter writing. It was drudgery for a couple of reasons, one of which was that he had a broken wrist all of his life from uh, okay. six. And so he's always writing with that. So his wrist would be pain. And secondly, um, as he says to John Adams, he said, you know, I get letters, thousands of letters from people all the time, people I don't even know. And they're asking for information. And Adams, you know, we'll, we'll do this in another one. It's really cool. Adams said, just do what I do. Just write a response so incomprehensible, so, so uh, stupid that the person will never bother you again. And then Adam says, no, I know you can't do that. You have to respond to all the letters seriously. And, and, and you have to understand too, I'll, I'll add that many of the letters that Jefferson composed were like short research papers. Yeah. <laughs> like ask him something, a, a question on, on husbandry, uh, on, on rotation of crops or how to farm hills. And he'll come up and I'll put five or six books on his rotating book stand and he'll, you know, copy so and so. So this, this is the best way to do that. And another person. So I highly recommend. 
So it's a research paper. So one letter could, could literally take him four hours to compose if he's oh. getting into it. Okay, maybe with Adams on that. <laughs> I, I suspect I would be too, but. <laughs> oh, no. But Adams, I, I want to add again, but Adam said, you know, do what I do. And Adam stops and says, but no, I know you can't do that, Thomas. You just couldn't do that. Oh, that's that's endearing. <laughs> yeah, and then they make this person out to be Satan, right? And he was so kind to strangers, even, but yeah. it's generous with his time too. Absolutely generous person, a kindly person, a very Christ-like figure. Christ was his hero, and when people drag him through the mud, it's astonishing. You and know, it's he was a true servant, a true public servant. Oh, all throughout his life. He served his fellow Virginians. He served the United States and he served humanity with his work um, as a scientist, yeah. smuggling in uh, rice, Piedmont rice into the States, bringing back Merino sheep, corresponding with other scientists in, in Britain and France and elsewhere about scientific studies. Uh, that's a, a book in itself that I might have to write someday, Jefferson on Science. There have been a couple other books, one of which is really quite good by Martin on Jefferson in Science. But uh, yeah, I might do that someday. Yeah. Oh. Question number five. You have walked us through the particulars of the letter. Why is the letter to you so significant? To me, moi, huh? Yeah. Well, um, and I, as I put it, it's the two M's. It shows his great regard for moderation and physical stuff and his high regard for morality. And I can say, Jefferson says, well, I'm just an ordinary person. You can just pick someone off the street and ask them what their daily habits are and mine would correspond perfectly with theirs. And of course that's, if it's not being modest, overly modest, it's being completely ignorant because sometimes he thinks he's so much just like the average person and he's not, of course, he's a lot wealthier. Um, he's uh, the owner of a plantation, um, you know, um, and he's a man of abilities, of uncommon abilities that other people just don't have and a uncommon capacity to actualize those abilities. So. He's not like that. So he, you know, and the other thing is, he says, uh, he talked about reading. So sometimes I go, you know, I'll, I'll get five to eight hours of sleep, depending upon whether I have a good book or good conversation. He says, I never, one of my favorite quotes, I never go to bed without an hour or half hours previous reading of something moral, whereupon to ruminate in the intervals of sleep. Now, I never really thought about the word intervals till today, for some reason. I've quoted this a Seemingly, seemingly a hundred times. What does he mean by intervals of sleep? You know, I, you read that quickly and you think, okay, I want to, I want something to think about prior to falling asleep, right? That's not what interval means. I sleep for a while, I wake up in two hours. And what are, you know, then I might have 15 minutes before I fall asleep again. So what am I going to do? Jefferson just can't have intervals. He's got to think about what he read. He goes, well, that's a perfect time to start thinking about what I, you mm -hmm. know, if we take the world, the word intervals seriously. Um, so he's got to make such perfect, you know, use of all his time that even when he wakes up in the middle of the night, he wants to put that to use by thinking about making himself a better person by right. reflecting upon what he read. And that's weird. Um, and, and we also know that Thomas Jefferson doesn't speak in figurative terms. He speaks in literal terms. Yeah. And that's why so. the, the people who calumniate him, people who, denigrate him uh, they get their mileage by taking him figuratively not literally if we take him literally we don't get in all the trouble we get into but he's a racist he's a rapist he's a hypocrite and all that well you do that because you read something Jefferson wrote and you say well he couldn't have meant that uh -huh. nobody means that you know you can't be a slave owner and be a good guy at the same time because every person who owned slaves was was truly wicked he, you know they don't consider to think well what about the black slave owners what about right. the slaves that were the super abundance of white slaves does that make a black person who owns slaves a bad person as well no one discusses that and so it's just a, a silly little thing he was uh, as this to me shows clearly he was a, a very 
significant and morality concerned person. And I think he was a highly moral person in his activities. I think he had great regard for his fellow human beings, black people included, in spite of what yes. people in Monticello want to say. Well, you know what, that leads me to another, um, Benjamin Banneker, is that how you pronounce his name? Banneker. Um, that, that just, um, I know we had talked about doing um, the letter, letters they wrote back and forth. Um, and I think in one of the letters that um, was written to Thomas Jefferson, he talks about how good he treated his slaves. Um, so maybe that's a good topic in the future too. Yeah, you, um, is is yeah. any letters between slaves and Thomas Jefferson or former slaves and Thomas Jefferson? And Benjamin Banneker itself would be a good one because that's highly yeah. complex and it's probably unbeknown to you. Um, he spoke highly of Banneker to other people. He promoted him, but in one intriguingly interesting letter, he questioned Banneker's ability in terms of his use of calculus and stuff and wondered if he wasn't being assisted by a, a friend, a neighborly friend. So it's an interesting case. And, you know, so maybe Jefferson doesn't come out so, so, so good in that perspective. Oh. We can talk about that. I'm not okay. interested in, in hiding stuff uh, right. like people accuse me of all. Oh, I'm a Holichex, a Jefferson apologist. I'm not. If there's something he did that just doesn't paint him in the best light, we need to talk about that as well. Right, right. Well, that's what this whole that's what this whole project is about is getting to know the real person, good and bad, right. um, and not passing judgment, not applying today's standards to something that happened a long time ago. Um, we we want to be fair and keep history as history, and not yeah, you're you're getting your historiography the right way, huh? You're doing it the right way. I like that. It's it, yeah. I I don't pass judgment on. You know, I was talking on Jefferson's views of religion to somebody and he goes, well, I don't particularly like that. And I said, well, it's not my job to, to make you like or dislike. It's my job to tell you how he thought, mm -hmm. what he thought when it came to, how he thought when it came to religion. And mm -hmm. if you don't like what he thought, then that's fine. I, you know, that's your, your thing. My job is right. to give you the facts, give you the right. information create a story from the facts that's consistent or very likely to be a true story about the way he thought when it came to God and morality and stuff like that. Right. Well, I've had a very good teacher <laughs> to, to keep to, you have taught me how to um, keep history in its place and clean. Keep it clean. It, we're just, <laughs> we make it a filthy, mud-slinging discipline like American politics. And <laughs> historians love to, American historians love to do that. They, they like to sling the mud and the, and the filth and the excrement. And uh, I, I, as I told you a number of it's just not the role of, a, of, of a, an above board historian to be engaged in that kind of stuff. It's just a create stories about what was the American Revolution, what was the Missouri Compromise, and let's get at the facts and go from there. Right. And I think that's what drew me to your work <laughs> um, and to begin with. Oh, no more questions. Woo -hoo. Um, oh, so I did want to add that Thomas Jefferson was a flexitarian. <laughs> I, when I saw that he didn't like to eat meat, eating little animal food, I was like, oh, well, yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what a flexitarian is, so you know you got one on me there. <laughs> I'll send you the Google definition. A strange word for me. Flex well, there's the yeah, there's flexitarian, pescatarian, vegetarian. You know, a lot why of... they choose flexus? Latin for in flexus. Flexus in Latin means bending or turning or something like that. Yeah, maybe the little going from the average use of meat to a little bit. I don't know. Is bending the rules of, of conformity, I guess. I, yeah, maybe. I don't know. You have to, so now we have to do Thomas Jefferson the rebel. <laughs> oh, he was a real rebel, yeah. Well, he wasn't, a, in, in one manner of speaking, um, a rebel in terms of his views on slavery, you know, and, and being a Southerner and being uh, uh, against slavery consistently all his life, that certainly didn't earn him any friends uh, in the South. 
And of course, people in the North hated him as well because he owned slaves, you know, the whole thing. We, we talk about that some other time. Why is it yeah. that you own slaves? You don't free them if you're so, you know, and that, that's another long issue. And it's like I said, where, where are they going to go? Everybody just assumes that you free them and everything's just fine. And, right. You know, <laughs> Right, right, yeah. 10,000 times after the uh, Civil War, when a lot of freed slaves would even go back to their former masters and say, please hire me to do something because I don't know where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do, I'm going to live. Right. So it's not as easy. We make it, we paint our picture, you know, with, with black and white colors and make it easily. easily. Yeah. yeah. It, it was really something that had to be done in the generations to come be, for that reason that you just said, that you just taught me something. For the reason you just said, um, because if you let somebody go, what, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? But it had to be, it, we had to look forward and plan it for future generations. And that is what's going to lead us into next week's topic. Yay. Um, because I am so fascinated with the history of the American West and Thomas Jefferson's um, part in that. And I think that goes into how this would help the slaves um, become free it, looking forward um to what uh, what america could become and would become and how that how the expansion west would help the slaves then in the future become closer to freedom um so next week we will talk about thomas jefferson's vision for the american west by examination of his report on the government for western territory in 1784, which would lead us to the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's an interesting, um, what we'll talk about, here's my teaser, Jefferson, more than any other United States president, perhaps any other person in political authority of his time, looked at land as pure possibility. And he was intrigued by the possibility of American Western expansion and the creation of new states, which was on the table in 1784. Um, and that would lead to answers to thousands, as I say, questions. I'm exaggerating, obviously, but numerous questions that he had about the West. One, he held a biological view at some point early on in his life, and perhaps all the way through, but I don't think so, that there was no extinction of animals. So when you found fossilized bones of mastodons, for example, he thought called the big buffalo, the Indians call it, he thought perhaps they're still alive somewhere in the West. So we'll figure out if the big buffalo's there, um, were there natives? What sort of natives lived, say, west of the Mississippi? Another intriguing question was, was there a waterway to the Pacific? And unlike today's time, waterways were so significant because they meant transportation of goods to other and then development of the areas with water. And of course, water was important for growing crops. So um, uh, I'll throw a teaser. Let me think of some. Uh, ask listeners, are many, many tens of thousands of listeners, right? Uh, if you could own, if you could come across or you were empowered, you owned a, a president or a, over a country, and you were in a position to acquire new lands, parcel them out into states, and name them, what names would you give those new states, and why? And we're going to see Jefferson does that in this, and he comes up with some very weird names. Some of the names, Michigania, Illinois, uh, we actually used in utilized states. Others, you're going to say, boy, these are really weird names. Oh, wow. Get them. And we'll talk about that. And I'll have something to say about his sort of perverse enjoyment of probably constructing these names. I don't think anybody's ever looked at that. Wow. He loved language so much. I suspect I'll talk more of this that in crafting this great resolution that left that that worked into the Northwest Ordinance, he probably spent hours and hours on names and, for, and justification for those names, and just had the time of his life doing that. We'll, we'll see. So I, I invite listeners to see what sort of names they might give to, and yourself, you might want to you know, come up with uh, five names of states. You know, put, project yourself back at the time. In Jefferson's day, where we don't know anything of the other states, and just think about, we're talking about Michigan, uh, Indiana, 
Ohio and you know states like that, parts of Minnesota and and stuff. And uh, so, what names would would you give those places if you could? Intriguing topic. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you base it? Wow. Yeah, that's something. Um, yeah. So we will learn next week how he came up with the names. And we will talk about his vision for uh, uh, an American West. I mean, he wow. He did not. He had a vision of land unlike other people. He land equal possibility, and I'll leave it at that. Oh, I can't wait. This is my my two favorite topics put together. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Holacek, and. You're Thank you for our viewers. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of One Work, Five Questions. And if you would like to, um, let me get that screen up. If you would like to contact Dr. Holacek to book him for an event, um, to speak at one of your events, you can reach him at mholacek at hotmail.com or his Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, Bring Him Home to Monticello, Citizens for Change. Or if you'd like an autographed book, um, I will have uh, a list of his books in the description of the video and you can contact him to make those arrangements. Thank you so much, Dr. Holacek, for you're, sharing you're, your expertise. And I look forward to next week. It should be a lot of fun. I, uh, today was fun and next week will be fun as well. So thank you yeah. for having me and we'll do this again. See you later. Okay. Bye everyone. <laughs>